You're watching Deprograms. This is the New Culture Forum's latest show, committed to fighting back against the forces of ideological conformity, particularly among the young. My name's Harrison Pitt. I'm a senior editor at the European Conservative, and I'm thrilled to be joined today, as ever, by Evan Riggs, who is a freelance journalist, and our special guest this week, Tom Rousel, uh, an historian and the creator of the popular YouTube channel, Survive the Jive. Now, Tom, you went fi fairly viral last week when you put out a, a pretty devastating takedown, both on YouTube and on Twitter. I think on YouTube it's got about 190,000 views and on Twitter about s over 600,000 views. Pretty devastating takedown of the BBC's um, Horrible History Sing Song mm. for effectively lying about uh, the, the genetic history of the British Isles. What, what moved you to, to produce a video on that subject and, and what do you think were the most egregious errors made in that, in BBC production? Um, well, thanks for having me here, Harrison. I, uh, I think I, I knew about it two years ago and I sort of forgot about it. And then it was suddenly um, on Thursday, everyone was talking about it again. And I thought a video would be, a, it'd be good to do a video and just specifically say what, what's wrong with each of the claims made in the song. and. Um, I've got two children now as well, and this is aimed at children. So I think mm. two years ago, um, I didn't have, well, I, my child, first child had only just been born. And now I'm, I'm a bit more sensitive to misinformation directed at children, especially from a mm. you know, state broadcaster like Absolutely. the BBC. So uh, I, I want to make sure that people realize that some of the material that's being directed at children isn't appropriate because it's very inaccurate and misleading. Uh, I think the most uh, egregious claim within the song is the first one, which is that the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers of Europe were black. Um, I, I think there were some people pushing back on my video, uh, and if what I think is quite a dishonest angle, saying like, conflating black as a complexion, mm. saying what well, well, they might have been dark skinned. But I point out in that video, obviously that these people didn't watch it, that within the legal framework of what black means in Britain, it exclusively refers to sub-Saharan African, regardless if in some other parts of colonial British colonies. Like, like, like Jamaica or Haiti. We, we, we might have called non-Africans black. We might once have called, in some scenarios, Aboriginal Australians black. Mm. But we don't do that now. And within the video, there is a montage. The man singing is, is a man of African ancestry. And there's a little montage of famous black British people at the end. And they're all Africans. There's no South Asians, for example. Yes. So if they were saying that Cheddar Man is black because of skin color, why didn't they show some Indian people? Because they is. are black by that definition. When you say that there's a montage, and by the way, everyone should watch this video on YouTube. Like, was, uh, was, uh, oh, on uh, your uh, sorry, I meant like a collage rather than a montage because there's all like cutouts of the photographs of different famous black British today, people. Though, today though, today. Modern, so modern, so modern, people like modern. Stormzy and people like Marcus Rashford. I didn't recognize very much. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, uh, okay. Um, uh, yes, and to that, the most egregious claim was that was the first one about Cheddar Man. Well, they were trying to claim, it, well, they were trying to indicate that the, the name of the song is, well, we've always been here. Been here from the we've start. Been here from the start. And we is doing a lot of legwork in that, <laughs> in that title. What, who is we? Well, the man singing is a man of sub-Saharan African origin. Mm. And all the people at the end shown are people of sub-Saharan African origin. So I think you can reasonably conclude that we means people of sub-Saharan African origin. Not Western hunter-gatherers and not North Africans either. People, not North e Africans. Emperors like Septimus Severus, no. who may have had a slightly darker complexion than anyone here uh, does, but is not sub-Saharan African in, 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 in that meaningful way, which they themselves make clear when, uh, when at the end they say, look, here's the proof of, our, of this continuous black history in the British Isles. The fact that people like Stormzy and Marcus Rashford are here today you know, th this is what it's flowered into. It's like, well, no, no, that's a much more recent development. The, f the, the fact that people, the fact that people like Stormzy and Marcus Rashford exist as citizens in Britain has a lot more to do with what's happened in terms of immigration over the last 60 years, since 1948, primarily, than it does with anything that was going on in 10,000 BC. Quite so. And, and all that, okay. Um, I guess maybe the, the biggest question um, would be, why do you think the BBC is so keen to promote this sort of like historical revisionism that we see? I mean, you studied uh, ancient history, um, especially with uh, the Vikings and the different sort of pagan tribes up north. And I mean, now even if you if you look on Netflix, you know, you'll see like black Viking queens, you know, roaming around on horseback, and it just seems mm -hmm. to be so incredibly pervasive this sort of revisionism, mm -hmm. which which seems. I mean, actually really kind of bizarre. It seems like a, a massive overreach to me because 
the, it, why 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 would the why would the world need to be diverse from the very from the very outset? Like, why would you actually need to prove? Like, why why would modern mm. diversity be sort of instantiated upon this sort of like ancient legacy? Like, it, it's okay that people were you know separated and segmented and uh, homogenous for a very long time. That's not intrinsically bad thing. Well, I think it's quite interesting what you brought up because the framing sort of legitimizes the position that they're actually are trying trying to oppose because a nativist argument would say you know we've been here we've been we were here first and this is our country mm. and therefore and that's a, an argument against immigration well they're by trying to legitimize the presence of sub-saharan africans uh, in britain today they they're trying to you know sort of uh, proto-chronological argument where they're pushing back the arrival of these people <laughs> to try and give it legitimacy mm. well they're saying therefore that Having a longer um, period of habitation within an area gives you more of a right to yeah, be yeah, there, which is a, they're legitimizing the nativist argument. They're, they're saying that there's a nativist prescriptive right to settlement, and that's a, and this is also the sort of thing that they will happily admit in other parts of the world. I mean, you know, you, 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 good luck finding a liberal in Britain who isn't. Uh, w willing to defend the right of Aboriginal Australians to remain a, a majority in, say, the 18th century, or you know, the, the Maori in New Zealand, mm -hmm. it, you know, are, are the people's n nativist prescriptive right to, to having some kind of national homeland it is is granted even retrospectively, even before international law existed on, the on these sorts of issues. And now that it does exist, it's denied to people in Europe. Sure, yeah, it's like nationalism for the Ukrainians and nobody else, nativism for, you know, everywhere that the British people went, but not for the Brits. Indeed, yeah. yeah. And that, that's, that seems to be the trend. So there's a, there's a very insidious uh, liberal double standard on, on this question. Um, I, I think it has a lot to do with um, turning trying to turn the population. So I think a lot of people go along with it, um, th these ideas, because they're ignorant. I think, I think that's probably largely true. But there are lots of people who are certainly aware of the fact that you know, the, the, the sub-Saharan African presence in this country is of much more recent mm -hmm. provenance. And it seems to me that the only reason I can think of why they would be willing uh, to lie about it is, is pre precisely to provide a post hoc justification for what has already happened, mm -hmm. because to, to try and present the unprecedented rates of immigration we've seen in the last 60 years as part of a long-running historical trend rather than an aberration yes and, and to provide a post hoc justification for it. that seems to me what's going on and, it, and particularly directed at children what you're effectively trying to do is is, is turn the, the the next generation into amnesiacs in relation mm. to their own history which is which is a, a very sinister thing to be trying to do I, I, I just very quickly I, I want to recount a, a story about my my my, my youngest brother uh, Toby he's age 14 and um, John Blank, tell, tell, tell our viewers who John Blank is because he's mentioned in, he's mentioned in the video as well. And it's, I think it's the only claim they actually get right. Yeah, well, he's <laughs> the only example of a black person who I think can be uh, widely agreed by every historian definitely was a, a black person of sub-Saharan African origin. The others are, n or some of them certainly not, or s probably not. In, in, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, this one, I, they got right. But they, in this case, the problem is they've exaggerated his importance. He was a trumpeter in the court of King Henry VIII, and I think, I think Henry VII as well, previously. Mm -hmm. um, not a, an historian of the well, Tudor. I, I, I actually don't think that's true, I think, because I think the reason, I think it was just Henry VIII, because I think he came along with Catherine of Aragon's mm -hmm. um, entourage when, he, when, when Henry married Catherine, when, well, must, I think it was 1516. But in any case, yes, he, he, he was a pretty insignificant historical figure. He played mm -hmm. a trumpet, and yet his Wikipedia page <laughs> is enormous. Mm -hmm. uh, what well, was not actually enormous, but it's a bit much bigger than it should be. And, like, Good luck finding any white tru trumpeters in the court of Henry VIII who, yeah. who, who, who get that kind of All the many treatment. musicians and jesters mm. and whatever he would Indeed. have had. Not, not, no one knows their names. They're <laughs> not important. Well, this is the story. My brother, so my brother, my youngest brother Toby, he's now 14, had a whole lesson devoted to John, to John Blank in, in, in school. And so I thought I'd do a little experiment. It's just, it's, just, it's just, you know, a single experiment. But I encourage everyone else to do it, our viewers to do it, particularly if they have children. Uh, I said, okay, so you know who John Blank is. You had a whole lesson devoted to John Blank. Do you know who... Martin Luther is? Do you know who John Calvin is? And do you know who Thomas Cromwell it was? Uh, and he only, knew who Luther, he only knew who Luther was, he didn't know who the other two were. And uh, he even remarked himself when I told him who Thomas Cromwell was. He said, God, so you mean to say that I, I, in, in school I've been taught about Henry VIII's trumpeter, but not his Lord Privy Seal? Yeah. yeah that's the situation in which we, we find ourselves. But that's very sad. <laughs> it is, but what, what do you think of this then? What, why, why do you think there's this impetus? Um, within the educational system, there's the certain belief that like in order to and it's not actually unfounded there is some research to show it's true that providing role models for children who 
look like them are like from their same ethnic background encourages them and uh, also they, it's shown that uh, I can't remember the study but it's like a psychology study where they showed that children who felt proud of their origins mm. were more likely to perform well mm. well if that is so then what is the effect of been here from the start on the white majority who uh, subjected to it. Why would you be proud of a trumpeter? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, also too. I mean, if we're if we're really living in, in sort of uh, you know this multicultural, globalized you know Britain, London, you know why can't you pull from anywhere else in the world or any other part yeah, of the Commonwealth it's, it's to find you know a mm. hero that looks like you? Like, why do you have to kind of like mm. go back uh, six hundred years to find some guy who is you know just essentially a non-entity mm. just you know pull pull from you know forget Martin Luther what about Martin Luther King does he not also apply yes mm. yes but no, I, I agree and um, uh, th that is an interesting point you make about how it, you know the, the, the if the, if the concession is being made at the outset that people are more likely to gra gravitate towards role models if they look like them, then if you're basically writing writing all of the most important iconic figures in British history out of the script, you know Gladstone was dragged through the mud, Churchill's being dragged dragged through the mud, practically everyone um, with, with any kind of name recognition in British history is being dragged through the mud. Then what what impact is this going to have? How is this going to demoralise the, the the long established ancestral population of of these islands? Um, but let, let's go into so, so obviously the BBC is trying to falsify the, the, the genetic history of, of the British Isles for, for very obvious, I would say, modern day political purposes to do with diversity mm -hmm. and racial politics. You know quite a lot about the genetic history of these islands, so let, let, let's let's go into that a little bit, so that because I think it's important that viewers are better informed to react to this sort yeah. of thing. So let's, starting with the Western hunter gatherers, like, like what genetic imprint have the Western hunter gatherers had on the formation of the, the early population of Britain? Well, the it should, at the time they existed, there wasn't Britain. It was it was just part, the continent was connected to the, Brit the Britain. It wasn't yet okay. an island. Okay. So it, it's somewhat uh, anachronistic to even talk about Britain okay. at that stage in history. Okay. Uh, uh, which is why I got annoyed when they talk about the first Britons were black. There weren't <laughs> there were no Britons. The Britons were a, a Celtic people mm. in the Iron Age. The Mesolithic is a warm period following the Ice Age, and it there were very, the previous diversity that had of, of Paleolithic Europe started to be reduced to just one race if you like to use that term uh, scientists don't they would say population um, and that was pretty much the same all across Western Europe a different population lived in Eastern Europe uh, there, there were two populations in Europe the Eastern hunter gatherer and the Western hunter gatherer we today descend from both uh, but we now have more ancestry from the Eastern ones actually oh, really? but due to the Bronze Age things that happened in the Bronze Age but the Western Hunter Gatherers, uh, they we've, we've known since at least 2016 that they lack the alleles uh, associated with lighter complexions mm -hmm. in modern Europeans. Um, gene expression is quite complicated. Um, I'm, I'm, to clarify, I'm a historian, I'm not a geneticist, but I know a bit about the way genes uh, cause phenotypes, that's the ex expression of uh, visible genes uh, in, in behaviours and in the body. But the we, we, even when we're predicting a modern person's skin colour, for example, for a crime scene, you wouldn't be 100% confident that you could guess it, but you got, you got it in the, the right sort of ballpark. But when an ancient population which will have different genes that, uh, affecting uh, complexion, it's less confident. For example, the Koreans lack the genes associated with lighter skin in uh, that Europeans have today, but you wouldn't say a Korean was black. No, it, mm. there are other genes involved besides the ones that we have now that are affecting complexion. So yeah, it's the likelihood that they were dark skin, but how dark is pretty hard to say. And yeah. scientists looking at different WHG Western Hunter Gatherer skeletons in different parts of the world. Lochbor is famous in uh, Luxembourg. Le Bragna Man in Spain. Our one is Cheddar Man. It'd be the most famous one in Britain. But they're, they're, they all say probably dark-ish, but the, what, the, no one in Europe has made anywhere near a claim that they were as dark as the, the scientists behind Cheddar Man is. And I pointed out in a different video that one of the men behind the Cheddar Man reconstruction in 2018 was uh, Tom Booth, who works for the Natural History Museum, or he did then. Um, he's a geneticist. And he had previously com collaborated with um, some academics from my university, uh, UCL, the year before, 2017. And they basically said that they needed to change the way, scientists and historians need to change the way we talk about ancient people and report on genetics in the media because otherwise you feed into white supremacist narratives mm. and Brexit related things. So he was specifically <coughs> bringing up Brexit yes. as mm. a problem. and. 
you know, within a year later, he's encouraging the darkest. They had a uh, phenotype prediction range for the skin complexion of Cheddar Man, and he went for the darkest model possible for the reconstruction, which he didn't make. It was a professional reconstruction, uh, uh, forensic reconstruction, that is. Uh, and anyway, then the media took photos of it, and the photos were darkened even further for the, it, when you see the actual reconstruction is a bit lighter than it, the photographs uh, in, on the front pages. Wow. So there has been a process to push uh, to get to this final stage, which is uh, a very unrepresentative I, th I think maybe it'd be model. even worth pointing out that wow. even, even if, you know, you or I had, you know, completely jet black skin, but nothing else was different. We would also still not be sub-Saharan African-esque yes. no. black because obviously skin color is the most obvious difference, but there are other differences in sort of, you know, general physiognomy, um, hair texture, you know, different ways that, you know, sickle cell, blood types. Yes. Um, there are actual differences, which well, is these, why... Well, these people all had blue eyes. Yeah. At that stage in... in uh, all the pe By these people, you mean the Western hunter-gatherers? Western hunter-gatherers did not have the diversity of eye colors associated with modern Europeans. They only had blue eyes, and we have blue eyes today because of them. So mm. that's inherited directly from them. Anyone in mm. the world who has blue or green eyes, because green eyes is, an, is when you have a mixture of brown mm. and blue eye genes. So. It's, it's, it's actually one of the points you make well in the video, and it's a great antidote to the sort of racism that people are worried, that people are worried necessarily emerges from this kind of scientific investigation that you point out how N Nelson Mandela despite obviously being uh, sub-Saharan African unquestionably being sub-Saharan African well, actually has lighter skin than many say Tamil people who have right. much darker skin but it doesn't mean that there's any it, it would be ludicrous even if we, I mean it would never happen but even if we were to find a Tamil uh, you know I, I don't even I don't know the, 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 the necessary terminology but let's say that we were to find some kind of Tamil you know, uh, skeleton from 8,000 years ago in Britain, that wouldn't substantiate the claim that black people had been here from the start either, mm -hmm. unless you're being very per permissive with your use of the, the term black. Uh, I think so too, and it's important to recognize that we have legal meaning for black, in, and black, in, when you use it in like on, the, on the of, census. Yeah, yeah. It, it means uh, Sub Saharan African. And in America as well, English speaking places, when they say black, they do not mean Tamils, they do not mean. Mm. Or, uh, Aboriginal Australians, they only mean that. So it's very disingenuous when people start saying, oh, you know, it's just talking about a skin colour. It's not talking about mm. a skin colour. And even when we're using the old, you know, outdated terminology of race, the word mm. race comes from an Italian word that means lineage, mm. and therefore isn't really talking about phenotypes, even mm. if you, even if early um, scientists like uh, uh, the, 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 well, Darwin for one, but um, uh, Linnaeus as well mm. was the first. Uh, the Swedish. Yeah, yeah. He, he was the first to create taxonomy of human races. And, you know, he they may have used phenotype to group people, but that yeah. wasn't because they were grouping them just by phenotype, they were grouping them by lineages. It, and, yes. uh, I mean, <laughs> it's disingenuous to try and conflate the two. And it's, it's not really, we're not talking about skin colour, we're talking about pe populations, yes. different populations. So I was a little bit ac anachronistic then, you ri rightly corrected me when I said you talked about Western hunter-gatherers being the original Britons, but so, so, so the original Brit the original Britons are the Celts. Is that correct? Um, uh, well, I, the let's, let's talk about let's talk about the let's talk about the sort of the the, the, the the different peoples that have gone into forming sure. what we now call the original Who's Britons. Well, go on. Yeah, who's yeah. yeah. really been there from yeah. the start? Well, yes. that that lineage, the, those Western hunter-gatherers were were largely replaced across Western Europe were um, from 8,000 years ago the first farmers left Anatolia what's now Turkey yes. moved through the Balkans in two waves some went up the Danube into Central Europe and some went along the Mediterranean around to Iberia and then the two different groups reconvened about uh, 7,000 years ago in France and then uh, and then they finally they moved to Britain and Scandinavia the last places they uh, colonized and started to introduce farming to them. And what is the name of these people? Um, they're known, uh, the, the, when they were in Anatolia they're referred to as Anatolian hunter-gatherers but once they have moved into, an, in this, once they develop farming they're sometimes called Anatolian Neolithic farmers. Yeah. Once they come into Europe and mix with the Western hunter-gatherers they're called Europe, early European farmers. So the early European farmers conquered Europe in the sense that they brought farming, at, but the Western hunter gatherers were like still living alongside them in, po in little corners, you know, in the woods or whatever, while the good farmland uh, uh, was now being taken by farmers. There's a lot of benefits to having farming and some drawbacks. We won't go into that now, but sure. um, these people uh, were themselves later replaced. Um, I should say that my paternal and my maternal lineages 
both it, this is an unusual thing not most people wouldn't say this but both of them come from western hunter gatherers so the idea that they just completely wiped out is not true we we have western hunter gatherer dna not very much of it but it's it, it's in us now and we are the only people who have any you know claim of of uh, kinship with these with these extinct people uh, so although we're not the same as them because we mm. descend a lot from these anatolians i'd say maybe five or ten percent of our dna comes from the western hunter gatherers but uh, 40 to 50 percent comes from these anatolians and sorry when you say our dna you're are, are you referring to the dna modern of northwest europeans modern northwest europeans and that would include us and that would also yeah. include the french that would also include the spanish that would also include oh spanish is a bit different they're about they're a lot more anatolian than us. they've got a lot okay. more of the farmer dna than we okay. than we do but, when, uh, but when, 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 so when when the celts so the celts are i think regarded that's, that's as the, later on the, much later mm. on but they're regarded as sort of if, if you're talking about the original britons you would talk you would talk about the celts wouldn't you yeah, well, the term Britain was is first uh, is used by the Romans to cool. describe the people of this this island, um, and at that time they were a Celtic-speaking people with Brythonic language, and um, the word Britain may or may not mean tattooed people, uh, which is could be a could be a name that the the Gallic tribes used for them, or it could be something they called themselves. Mm. We don't really know, but Britannia is what the Romans referred to this island as, and after the people who lived here, and uh, they were not the same as the Anatolians because there's a big a really huge event in history that happened 2500 BC just as Stonehenge was being finished uh, there was an invasion of another people who were significantly descended from Ukrainian Neolithic Ukrainians and they ushered in the Bronze Age to Britain and they replaced approximately 90% of the population wow. of this island so it was a huge event in history and this was only people in the 19th century scientists used to um, Talk, think that this might have happened. It was very much, uh, very became very unpopular in the early 20th century, up until uh, 2015, when a paper was released that used scientific. Why was that, it unpopular? Uh, it was associated with, um, you know, partly with Victorian and colonial, like old, outdated uh, anthropological techniques, but uh, also somewhat associated with Gustav Kosmer, who was a, uh, an archaeologist who became associated with the Nazis to some extent. Uh, but he was, um, unfortunately for modern anthropologists, historians, archaeologists, and quite embarrassingly for them, it, a lot of those theories turned out to be right mm. when brought under modern scientific scrutiny, mm. uh, which uh, since it's 96 as well, a lot of, um, you know, the humanities have been about bashing earlier forms of academic uh, disciplines. And, and uh, what, what, um, I know one person said that um, we're, we're asking, um, we're asking 20th century questions with 21st century technology and getting 19th century answers. Uh, <laughs> it's quite funny. Yes. But um, that happened, and that actually, these people in this uh, in this part of the world, that that you well that Ukrainian element uh, called Western Steppe herders is brought into this island by an archaeological cult a culture called the Bell Beaker people, and associated with their alcoholic. Uh, the beverage containers, their vessels, uh, ceramic vessels, and um, we largely descend from them. Okay. Uh, and they spoke a language which would belong to the same language family as Celtic and English, but it wasn't Celtic or English. Uh, and the Scots, especially even today, are pretty much the same, and the Irish as well, pretty much just for the same as those people. Yes. But England, being closer to the continent, has had more influence subsequently from other migrations uh, than the rest of these Isles have. Um, the next migration was quite minor, and that was the first Celtic speakers, which would have been sometime around 800 BC. It didn't result in a huge shift like the Belbica migration, more of a, a, a concentrated influence in the southeast of this island, uh, and it would have been brought over by people who were genetically what we call French people today. I see. Uh, but they spoke Celtic languages, and for some reason, the languages of the Celts spread across the British Isles and became the dominant languages. And when was this, roughly? Yeah, uh, sometime maybe 900, 800 BC. Okay. It doesn't. It's not a, accompanied by a huge invasion like the Beaker folk, yeah. where ninety percent of the population was replaced in just two hundred years. Yeah. Rather, it's a gradual trickle of French DNA coming in, sure. which probably represents merchants or settlers. It's not very clear exactly what was happening at that period. All we know is that the result is. Celtic languages dominate and Celtic culture as well you start to see material culture coming in and then the so Romans come after that of course yes. which was uh, what this is now the historical period where we have written text of explaining course. who was involved the names of the generals yes. uh, everything uh, but 
the genetic record shows that there was no lasting impact of the Roman, of the Roman settlement. And, and it's a really excellent point which you make in your video which made me think a great deal. It's just such a it's, it's an excellent point about no one in a million years would say that the American invasion of Iraq or the American invasion of, of Afghanistan just because troops were stationed there, garrisons were stationed there, have had a huge genetic impact on the population of Afghanistan, on the population of Iraq. And yet it seems to be par for the course that, you know, activists will make a huge amount of the fact that there were, because the Roman army was pretty multi multicultural and multi-ethnic, Oh, and a North African soldier manned Hadrian's Wall. Therefore, we've always been multicultural. Whereas, doesn't mean doesn't doesn't mean that there was any <laughs> sort of lasting genetic impact of that hmm. of that um, no. a, 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 a administrative role that the Romans played here. Well, because once they left, when did they leave? Was it was it AD seventy that they got thrown out by the Celts of Britain? Whenever uh, well, they didn't get thrown out by the Celts so much. I think they just. They, they, they started pulling their forces back left. in because yeah. they weren't, it wasn't really <laughs> worth it. They didn't, and the, the, the empire was the Western Empire was falling to bits, and, and there was not. They didn't want to. I guess it was a bit like our ret retreat from India. I guess <laughs> yes. just weren't powerful enough yes. to, to maintain colonies. Yes, but there wasn't a massive civil war afterwards. Anyway, okay. So, so in eighty seven, so I think it was in eighty seventy. I could be wrong. Fact check as well. We'll, we'll correct me if I'm wrong. But eighty seventy, the, the the Romans leave um, Brit Brit Britannia without. A bit later than that, actually. It was yeah. a bit later. Yeah. When, uh, when was it? Yeah, uh, it was in the fifth century. I believe was it uh, uh, a bit later on yeah oh, oh m not Ah, oh, God, I don't know the exact year. Sorry, uh, but I think never mind. It, do it doesn't matter too much. But once the Romans had left, they, the, the, the the population was still pretty intact in terms of it, yeah, the its genetic makeup. The po population of the British Brit Britain, South Britain, well, especially, which is where the Romans were, what's mm. now England, mm. um, was not indifferent. It wasn't different autosomally from what it had been prior to the invasion. What's that it, word? Sorry, what's autosomally it? is uh, so usually when people are looking at genetic studies, they're either looking at uniparental markers, which are haplogroups, which that kind of study has been around since the 90s. But more recently, is people prefer to look at autosomal DNA, which is more like your overall all-round ancestry, mm. and uh, it's more revealing. Uh, it doesn't. Yeah, it, it's what people look at when they're doing DNA tests, you know, mm. that kind of thing, like I'm 50% Irish yeah. or whatever like that, you know. So, sorry that these technical questions keep interrupting the narrative, but look, anyway, con con continue. So, um, yeah, there had been, we know from G Roman DNA in Rome and in the British Isles that Rome in general was extremely diverse. That mm. is true. It was a very multi-ethnic, and in fact, the city of Rome, which had previously been genetically very European in the Republic era, mm. during the Imperial era became essentially a Middle Eastern city. Mm. It was so populated by North Africans and Middle Easterners. So it was, it did become less European and there were even many Middle Eastern people stationed in Britain. There could have been some black people, but we haven't got any actual, we haven't found any. Mm. Uh, I said that there's no, there aren't any we can point at, but it's possible that there were some. Mm. Uh, but certainly all the people they, they're pointing at in that video yeah. are not black. To, to, to talk about Septimus Severus very quickly. Uh, Septimus Severus was, um, he was half Punic, which is like a Semitic colony in North, North yeah. Africa. Sort of, uh, sort of like modern day sort of Tunisia, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I think so. But they would have had significantly, well, they significant amounts of Levantine. Ancestry. Oh yes, I'm not saying genetically, yeah. I'm just geographically. Sort yeah. Of so it? and then the half, he was half Roman, probably a so I mean half Italian. So I'd say he would, he would look pretty like someone from the Mediterranean, uh, if not like an Arab, he would yeah. might look like an Italian. But he wouldn't have looked like what we'd now call a black but person. But it's hilarious though because they claim him as black and again as you point out in the video there are historical sources, which may be apocryphal you point out, attesting mm. to the fact that when Septimus Severus encountered uh, a, 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 a sub-Saharan African in, on the eve of battle, he regarded it as a terrible omen. Death omen, yeah. 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 And wanted him removed from the ranks and so it, not only was he not black as you say, the thing, yeah. he, he was a, a racist by any modern, yeah, <laughs> any modern yeah. definition. Even, even if that story is apocryphal, it's contemporary, so it still reflects, it, it's, con it's plausible enough that it could be true at, at, for a contemporary oh, yes. telling. So that means yeah. it reflects a common attitude at the time, Absolutely. even if it isn't an actual event that happens yes. historically. And I, th I think it's fair to say then that this, the, 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 so you, the, 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 what's that first migration you talk about, the really significant one, the beer? The bell beaker. The bell beaker. Mm. You, and this, before we came on air, you said that you, you think that it's, you know, the consensus is that the second most significant p migratory flow into Britain was the Anglo-Saxon one, yes. which I think happened in about the fifth century or the sixth mid century. Fifth, mid fifth century. Mid fifth early, century. Well, it begins at the early fifth century. Though obviously, I was wrong to say that the Roman uh, Empire left yeah. in the fifth century. But um, the uh, the Anglo-Saxon one na it initially resulted in a seventy-five to eighty percent replacement of the population of the eastern side of the island. Okay. But then that 
that very, very Germanicized Eastern side mixed with the more Brit Brythonic Western side to, cr to create the current more, something more similar to the current levels of distribution, mm. whereby modern English people range from a minimum of 25% to a maximum of about 50%. Anglo-Saxon, really? so it's a pretty significant, not as significant as the Bell Beacon no. migration, but where, still. Where, where you say it's about 90%, the Bell Beacon. About 90% replacement of the yes. population. Yeah. So would it be fair to say then, Tom, that what we're currently living through in modern day Britain is the biggest sort of genetic shift in the, you know, the population, the, the makeup of this island in 1500 years? I would say that what we're seeing now in Britain and perhaps other countries is the largest population shift in the history of mankind. Mm. This kind of the sheer numbers and the sheer and the extreme uh, the extreme distinction genetically and culturally as well between the populations involved and the distances that they're traveling is not is it's completely unprecedented. Right. There is an effort to create a narrative with all these very real history of migrations. It is true that the history of mankind is a history of migrations and of different populations mixing, but it's adjacent populations mixing. Right. Mm. And it's not and it's, and it's mixing slowly. every 2000 yeah. years or so, mm. not what we're seeing now, which is the sudden throwing together yes. of all the Earth's people in this chaotic way, mm. which is well seemingly chaotic, but is quite uh, quite deliberately engineered in some cases. Absolutely. Why do you say so? Uh, well, it was, it's deliberate policy to to let uh, to, to allow them in uh, in many cases, and also as we're talking about um, when I say engineered, I also mean socially engineered in the fact that like the kind of things like this song that we're talking about is intended to. Uh, manufacture the consent of the populace mm. to this thing continuing. Mm. So yes. you're not you're less likely to oppose it if you think it's something that's always happened is quite normal. Hmm. So we're completely off the edge of the map then, which is typically where the monsters and dragons lie. <laughs> um, what do you think? You know, if you were um, a historian in like let's say 2300, looking back at you know uh, our time now, 2023. What do, you, what do you think would be the, you know, kind of the lasting impact as, you know, kind of compared and contrasted with these other mass historical events, which, you know, I mean, it's, it's, we're divorced from it now when you say like 90% of a, an island's population got wiped out, you know, but that's probably wasn't a very pleasant time for those people over the course of that 200 years. I'm not suggesting that something like that would happen now, but what do you think, you know, this has been going on for like 30 to 60 years, you know, depending on how you look at it. You know, what do you think the next 140 years will look like? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not able to predict so easily, but um, I'd say that uh, you will. There are a few different potential uh, outcomes, and not all, none of them are particularly attractive mm. um, uh, or desirable. Uh, I hope that in 2300, people there are people who are able to understand what's happened historically and give us a fair shake and understand how things got to the way they are. Um, but it would, I think, be quite a confusing uh, area of history to study, like the, the, the shift from the fall of the British Empire to what we're, where we are now is quite a radical shift. Yes, and they'd probably be hard pressed to, to because in, in these other cases where you know, populations are wiped out, that usually happens in the midst of, of war and conflict, and presumably the elites of the supplanted population actually wanted to remain the established population, whereas we in, in find ourselves in a very um, you know, historically uh, anomalous situation where our own elites couldn't care less about this sort of thing. And in fact, they've, 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 they've invited this de demographic transformation, this unprecedented dem dem demographic transformation upon sort of the British people's ancestral homeland, not only without their popular consent, but in plain defiance of it over a period of decades. Mm. Do you think that to continue kind of along this trend, it will force a sort of greater authoritarian control of different aspects of academia, like history, like, um, like biology, as we're seeing now with a lot of the trans things, or even just, you know, the study of genetics? Um, you know, I studied evolutionary psychology, which is, you know, massively taboo because mm -hmm. evolution itself is now taboo. Mm. I mean, basic Darwinian principles applied to the human animal are, are considered unpalatable now, even in just mainstream political discussion, even in many parts of the right. Um, do you think that this will not only from, you know, media companies like the BBC, but also just greater crackdown in academia will prohibit the study of things, you know, like um, like a phylogenetic tree? Um, well, I, I, I think that 
I got some hope for academia. I'm not as um, opposed to academia as some people on the right are. I, I, I definitely think it, we need the academy, we need these institutions, these are old institutions, and they are, uh, they have been sort of somewhat coerced by ideological enemies of Britain. Uh, but for example, the recent um, very poorly researched paper of claiming that, um, I can't remember the name of the author, a, a lady from UCL claimed that uh, the iron, the ironmongery, that the techniques of iron manufacture that facilitated the industrial revolution in Britain were invented by Jamaican slaves. And uh, there's been now a pushback from people within academia mm -hmm. saying this is all fake and yeah. this should never have been published, it's an yeah. embarrassment. And also uh, a man called Oliver Jelf has just done his master's thesis on uh, uh, debunking that, that previous oh, thing. Wow. So yeah. that's great. And there are people within academia who are pushing back even now. So I, I just can't see it going on forever because uh, if, they ca if, if re real intellectualism, ac academia exists for like to uh, encourage young people to learn how to question things, how to use critical reasoning. If that, for that reason, it will eventually, I think, become an obstacle for the people who have sort of taken it over. They, 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 they can't last forever, uh, I th uh, unless they just shut down the universities or whatever, or limit the way that people can stu study history. Yeah, I but mean, I uh, feel like a, the era of kind of soft power control is, is dead and gone, and now it's, you know, exerting more hard power and like actually forcing people out or, or clamping down on things that you can and cannot study is, you know, becoming much more naked and uh, transparent to everybody, even looking, you know, from outside the ivory tower in. Mm. And when you have to do that, it's, it's a sign that you're actually, you're weakening. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do agree. I think that, you know, maybe 30 years from now, but uh, it will eventually kind of come back to bite these people in the ass, much like, you know, founding any sort of a an ideology or, or a mythos on like a easily disprovable lie like mm. this uh you know we were here from the start video mm. is you know it, it's it, it only lasts as long as you can force people not to say things that they know to be basically true yes. yeah i mean every mm -hmm. everybody knows that you know sub-saharan africans weren't you know running all over the british isles for thousands of years <laughs> i mean obviously it's one of the ironies of it as well <laughs> is that they on the one hand these race baiting activists are very eager to to, to paint the story of Britain as a, just a, a litany of racist horrors, yet they also want to claim that Africans, uh, black people have been central to this story, pushing this story, the driving force of this story, the main characters in this story mm. from the very beginning. It, it, you know, it, 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 <coughs> it's, it's either a testament to the... To the Britain, I, I think it's neither, but it's, Britain's history is either a testament to the, to the sort of relentless victimhood of blacks, or it's a testament to the, the sort of heroism and centrality of blacks it can't yeah. it can't be both mm. it's interesting because from my my experience the the focus on their uh the black experience as one of victims is especially limited to the uh, 18th century and onwards they mostly focus on that mm. but when they talk about earlier they don't like to they like to it, do the opposite yes. and it's interesting because one of the if i was a i'm not a historian of the tudor era as i said but if i were to talk about the black population of that period of Britain, uh, I wouldn't mention the trumpeter. I would talk about the, the <laughs> I, I, I would talk about Van, uh, Van Leerden and the Blackamoors Act. There was a, uh, a merchant, uh, presumably he was of Dutch descent by his name, yeah, but I yeah. don't know. And he had attempted to, he, there was I, the, the population of, I should say the population of Britain around 1600 was about 4 million. And between 1500 and 1640, 140 years, the black population was something like 360 people. So they were never 360 people all there at one time, but mm. over, over a period of 140 years. I don't know how many lived at the, at the same time, the greatest number, but it can't have been very many, maybe between 10 and 20, somewhere like that. So uh, anyway, Van Linden had tried to ban them from the country. I'm not clear exactly why, but he didn't like them. And uh, he, was, he received pushback from uh, the owners, uh, this, this, they weren't slaves, they were servants, yeah. and their masters had said, no, we, we want these here, uh, they're, they're good for us, uh, so please stop interfering. So he took it to the Queen, Queen Elizabeth I, and tried to get her to uh, assi assi sign the Blackamoors Act to, to lim you know, basically banish all Blackamoors, as they called them, yeah. from the island. Uh, I, it was never enforced, um, but I mean, 
that some piece of legislation like that could be considered when the when probably we're talking about 10 people or something mm. like that <laughs> yes. is probably a very important insight into mm. what people thought about them yes. at that time, yes. uh, which they never mentioned. No, no. So well, why, why don't they mention that, actually? It's strange they don't mention that, because you'd think that, that that would be further proof of Britain's you know, inexpungible guilt when it comes to race relations. I've I got a feeling it's got to do with the fact that 10 people in a population of 4 million just makes them seem <laughs> not so significant, and the idea yeah. is to exaggerate the significance of sub-Saharan sub Africans in, in the history of this island. Mm. It seems to me that uh, one of the things that um, one of the pro one of the benefits of being a reasonably homogenous society, and as it, we've just been going a little bit through the genetic history of Britain, and to say that a population is homogenous doesn't mean that there's no sort of ethnic mix b baked into that homo mm. homogeneity. Mm. As mm. you say, what if you would you would say that the majority of the population of Britain even today is white British, and yet when you sort of do those sorts of studies, you find that oh gosh, there's Celtic, there's Mm -hmm. um, there's yeah, uh, Anglo-Saxon and all the rest of it. it those it, are all Northwest Europeans. Exactly. They're all indigenous Northwest European groups. Mm. All of them descend from the Belbica people of the of the Neolithic. Indeed. Uh, so they're really not. I mean, they're. I mean, they're just not very diverse. Yes. I mean, there's more diversity between two different neighbouring African tribes. Indeed. You wouldn't. You Indeed. wouldn't think anything of them In, swapping territories or whatever. Indeed, but the, the point that I think is important to make is that you, you don't disprove the existence of homogeneity in the present by pointing to diversity in the past, because over time what st would have struck, I don't know, people 2,000 years ago like a very d diverse array of tribes, now uh, all of that has gone into the unity, the homogeneity of, you know, sort of white British people today. Um, and it seems to me that homogenous society, in homogenous society, because we're talking about history, we're talking about academia, mm. you know, knowledge, the pursuit of knowledge, it seems to me that these things are always going to be much more contentious in an ultra diverse society. In, a, in an mm. ultra diverse mm -hmm. society, there is going beca because, particularly when you have a force fed diet of multiculturalism, which conditions people to view practically everything through the lens of their own little community, all of a sudden, like, not knowledge acquisition isn't a collective pursuit that we all enge engage mm -hmm. in as a hom homogenous population, we all care about it. N national history ceases to be unifying, it's, it becomes a source of, 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 of conflict. And you, we can see this in, in, in ultra-diverse societies that already exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in places like Liberia, in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo, Papua New Guinea, like, it, there's nothing unifying about national history precisely because there are all these competing tribes that have their own account of it. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that we're going in that direction very dangerously. Yeah, I agree. I think. I can only think of like very high functioning and successful states based on, a, w on an extremely uh, heterogeneous population. It's places like Singapore. Uh, hom that, homogeneous. Oh, uh, uh, heterogeneous. Well, heterogeneous. Well, heterogeneous yes. because they're very diverse people. So they're the Malays, Chinese. Oh, Chinese, sorry, sorry. Diversity in the case of Singapore. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Singapore. Racial sorry. diversity is baked into the Singaporean constitution. They, they make they it work with authoritarianism. Yeah. They, exactly. The only way to exactly. make that work is with authoritarianism. Every episode. <laughs> <laughs> sorry? I bring up Singapore every other episode. Evan's obsessed with Singapore. Oh, really? But you're yeah. absolutely right. <laughs> we, we have lots of examples, not just of... I, I don't know whether you really want to call Singapore a despotic state, but for the sake of oh, authoritarian, that's it's authoritarian, yeah. benevolently. But, but yes, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's, it's quite nice authoritarianism. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. I, do, we, we lose something yeah, though. Yeah. We lose, lose something special Absolutely. that England had, and if we have to move to a Singaporean model to make things comfortable enough that we can even live here, well, exactly. we've lost something quite important. We can't get back a again. Absolutely, in history, there are so, there are very many examples of of multi ethnic. Empires which are ruled with a sort of a, a bit of a rod of iron. There are many examples of Rattan Cane. So that it, right, yes, exactly. <laughs> there, there are plenty of examples of that, but there are very few examples of high trust, uh, self governing, law governed democracies which are diverse. And I, and I fear that um, I, I, I really. Well, let me ask you this. Our specific system of law yeah. is it, quite unique, well, except to the extent that it's been copied by other countries, but you know, it comes issuing from the people. We have common law and things like that. And we have people coming together based on shared traditions and heritage rather than on state dictated mm. ideologies and that that was something we have to move what we'll have to lose and what, that's one of the things that distinguish us from some of our neighbors in the continent mm. with the more you know napoleonic mm. models of governance and uh, it, that will be lost completely if we have to move away from that absolutely i think and i think british conservatives have have um, very naively relied on the innate power of those ideas and the innate attractiveness of the, those traditions without considering the conditions which make them attractive mm. at, at scale. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think that model is kind of 
done, but we haven't, people haven't really reconciled themselves with it. I think, you know, kind of the, the fall of Afghanistan, you know, a couple trillion dollars, a couple uh, hundred thousand soldiers, 20 years, and you still couldn't make people, <laughs> yes. you couldn't, you couldn't, you can't, you turn can't, them into you couldn't put a <laughs> democracy in place where people don't want it, simply. No. Yes. And I mean, that you know, that was really the, the true cruelty of it. You know, I, I have many friends who are Afghanis and, you know, they, they want to be, you know, part of Western society, but that's, they're, they're a vast minority. Um, and I, I think too, you know, this kind of what we're what we're seeing now is a, a sort of a reverb back from that, where everybody's kind of reconsolidating because mm. this era of um, not empire building, but sort of instantiation of values. We we realize that you know the reason these only took in a few small places is because the people there desperately wanted them to mm. and fought very hard for it. And unless you have a kind of the native population of a a country like uh, like Afghanistan or or even like Malaysia, right next to Singapore, who doesn't really want this, um, it's, it's just never going to happen. Well, well, I mean, a, a very quick, very wonderful example. I mean, it's, I think since 1847, the Liberian constitution has been modeled very explicitly. I mean, their, their capital is called Monrovia because it was James Monroe, who was the US president, tried to... Try, tried to uh, really? No, not, sorry. He wasn't president of Liberia, but the Americans played a role in trying to... I, I, trying to make Liberia a self-governing state on, mm. of, of the West of Africa. And uh, anyway, the point is, is that they've had the same constitution roughly as the United States for 160 years, but it hasn't necessarily served them well because it's not fundamentally the ideas, the, 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 the sort of the, the de jure, what's written on paper, which makes these ideas work, let's just say that. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, and like, the point I'd make in Liberia is that it's an incredibly diverse place. It's one of the most diverse places in the world in terms of tribe, in terms of religion. And, and that means that there, that, that there, is, there, isn't, there, there, there isn't the high trust necessary uh, in that society for, for the people to be governed with a very light touch in the way that they have been in the United mm -hmm. States and the way that we have been here, but before we before we go on, do you like to say something? Well, I was going to point out that the the breakdown of trust is often one one of the things that uh, uh, it's been observed that people in more diverse societies are less trusting mm -hmm. of uh, of of each other, and mm -hmm. uh, that's something you that makes that has knock on effects as you're just pointing out. That it doesn't matter how robust your system of laws are or the institutions. Mm -hmm. If people don't trust each other anymore, then it's much harder to make things, and worst of all, when they lose trust in the institutions, Absolutely. then the institutions become less le less effective, less po less possible to, to operate effectively. Or, 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 or if who, whoever runs the institutions alters the distribution of um, you know goods and power between competing ethnic groups in a society, then it doesn't matter if you have if you could have the most wonderful Montesquieu uh, constitution in the world. But if you know the, the legislature is, you know, is is pr primarily filled with people from a particular tribe, as might be the case in a place like Liberia, people don't have faith in that institution anymore because they don't you think of it as serving that first person plural that Scruton talks about. There isn't a, a first person plural. There's, there's just a series of different theys which which compete within those institutions rather than seeing those institutions as expressions of themselves and what they are. And that seems to me very. Um, Dangerous, and it seems to be where we're going. But just before we finish, Tom, let me ask you: We, we were, get, we're getting a bit doomer, and uh, I think. Do, do you think that these? I mean, I know you're an historian, not a sort of policy analyst, but do, but do you think that um, these trends can be reversed? That we can, you know, halt mass immigration and prevent um, pre pre prevent the, the potential disasters that await. Um. I know there are all sorts of legal obstacles to that prevent, which would prevent uh, uh, the, the, the halting of mass immigration. Uh, all that is required is a, is, an, is a sort of commitment to the, to the will necessary to achieve it, and it mm. can be achieved. Um, and that turning point is not necessarily about when someone's voted in or whatever, it's just about when, um, when the, the, the ideological currents change in a certain yes. direction. But my focus is not uh, on policies or politicians. I only f try and put out information that I think is right. And I think that some people will, some, uh, it may be for a, a brief period of history, hopefully, there will be uh, the you know, rigorous academic tradition of, of hit, you know, Western historians will survive in uh, maybe an under underground form for a while yes. before it can re reassert itself in the institutions. Where it belongs, um, but I think that it, it's it's that that is hi history as as a really rigorous discipline, 
although it begins with Herodotus, which is even, it's not really rigorous with him. It's, but it's not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but he's he's not like other uh, ethnographers. He is a historian. He yeah. is talking, uh, trying to be objective yes. in, in in certain not succeeding, but he's trying at least. And that is the tradition that Britain was drawing from when we began, you know, prop history as a real academic discipline, mm. uh, historiography, uh, academic historiography. And that has to survive, uh, otherwise you're just left with what, what, you know, we've been here from the start, things which are quite actually natural and intuitive, they're sort of they're very they're, they're human. ethnocentric, they're very narcissistic human. sort of chest beating saying we're the best or yes. whatever, which is, you find that everywhere. Yes. But actually looking at parts of um, you know, looking at history and trying to objectively understand what happened, mm. uh, even if people find it offensive. Just, uh, just to end maybe here, historically, on average, um, when two different groups of people, whether mm. they're direct neighbors or kind of far-flung foreigners, um, come together and clash in this way, um, does it tend to go relatively peacefully? <laughs> well, you can look at the history of these hours. Um, the different things can happen. The Mesolithic people were absorbed by the Neolithic people. We can't be sure how violent that was. The, the, in, the Bell Beaker people came, and within 200 years, 90% of the population is gone. Some people dispute whether that was a violent uh, encounter, but I would say I can't really imagine any reason when 90% of the population would disappear within 200 years other than through pretty abominable things happening. Uh, the Anglo-Saxon invasion was a mixture of peaceful interactions and violent interactions. The Norman conquest was an elite model with dominance with extreme violence, especially the harrowing of the North, uh, so that a new elite could take part. In every case, we see problems. Uh, the 20th, even in, we've already seen problems in this country and we're seeing problems in Italy right now. We're seeing lots of problems. Uh, so, not, but not all interactions are problematic. Of course, we can have nice interactions between the groups too. So it can be quite, complicated and different things can happen but I do think there will be a lot of problems hmm. uh, and there always are uh, and how the chips will fall is yet remains to be seen. Thank you so much Tom for coming onto the show it's been fascinating Evan thanks as ever. You've been watching Deprogrammed make sure to like subscribe leave a comment if you wish and we shall see you on the next one. Hello if you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.